With the average new car in America now costing over $40,000, you might be wondering, is there anything out there that's practical and efficient that won't break the bank? Well, the answer from Kia is this new second generation 2023 Nero. This is gonna be available as a hybrid, a plug-in hybrid, or a full EV, your choice, and all of them are gonna start under about $40,000. This generation Nero is really interesting because it has more legroom than a RAV4, but it's not quite a crossover in the traditional sense. Whether you want to call this a crossover or a pregnant hatch, I'll leave that up to you, but it is significantly less expensive than a RAV4 and will get you up to 53 miles per gallon. For this generation of Nero, they've decided to make the models a little bit more differentiated from one another. So the front end does change a bit if you get the electric version. We have full LED headlights in the top end trims to keep costs low. Not all models will have LEDs. And the front end definitely looks more clean and modern than the last generation Nero. It's certainly sharper and a little bit squarer in appearance. With an overall length of 174 inches, this is about the same size on the outside as a Taos, a Corolla Cross, or a Subaru Crosstrek. Whether you want to call this a upright hatchback or a crossover, I'll leave that up to you. But we do have the same kind of ground clearance that we found in the last generation Toyota RAV4, but we don't have the availability of all-wheel drive. If you want that, you will find that on the Corolla Cross Hybrid. The counterpoint to that is that the Corolla Cross Hybrid has a lot less legroom than we find in this and a smaller cargo area, also considerably lower fuel economy. This again will get up to 53 miles per gallon. The top end trims are rated around 48 miles per gallon and a little under 40 miles per gallon is what you can expect out of the Corolla Cross Hybrid. So definitely quite a different vehicle than this. Now the Corolla Cross Hybrid is gonna be a bit more powerful. As you'd expect out of a small crossover, we have privacy glass out back. We do have roof rails, but not crossbars. And then here we have the most controversial design element in the Nero. It's this different colored arrow blade. Now, if you don't want the two-tone theme, you can get a monochromatic Nero, and this will be body colored. Let me know what you think about that. I think it works in some colors, but not others. Obviously, if you get a black vehicle, it's gonna be black all the way around. This is a functional aero treatment. Air actually goes in right here, just behind this rear passenger window, and then it comes out right on the inside of this tail lamp module. The look is controversial, but also definitely distinctive. They have a really long third brake light right up there on top, integrated with that spoiler. There's still a windshield wiper there in case that's something that you're after. And then you'll find the backup lights down here at the bottom of the bumper. They've certainly made the entire vehicle look more crossover-like, and it reminds me a little bit back here of the previous generation Honda CRV in some ways. I think it's an attractive look, and I think it is prettier than the Kia Sportage. Let me know what you think about that in the comments section. At the moment, I'm considering getting rid of our long long-term Kia EV6 and getting something along these lines because it does appear to be pretty practical. I'd love to know what you all think about that as well. Should we get the hybrid? Should we get the plug-in hybrid? Should we try an EV or should we stick with the EV6 for a little bit longer? I'd love to know what you all think. Under this hood, we find the latest generation of Kia's high-efficiency hybrid system. That's different than the hybrid that we see in the Sportage, even though on the surface of things, they look pretty similar. Both have 1.6-liter engines, both have six-speed transmissions. But this doesn't use a turbo. Instead, it uses a naturally aspirated version of the 1.6 liter engine tuned for efficiency. And the sacrifice is, of course, power. This produces just over 100 horsepower, just over 100 pound-feet of torque in its own right. On the other side of the engine bay, it's mated to a 43 horsepower electric motor, and the whole system together will give you 139 horsepower, 195 pound-feet of torque. As with the more powerful hybrid system in Kia's lineup, this one uses a six-speed as well, but it's a six-speed dual-clutch transmission, not a traditional automatic. That means that at its heart, this is really a manual transmission, and that's part of why this gets higher efficiency numbers than we find out of the Sportage system. It's a lot smoother than the average DCT because the electric motor is over there on that side connected to the dual-clutch transmission, and when you're driving along in electric-only mode, that electric motor is actually using the DCT to motivate the vehicle forward. So in low-speed stop-and-go and crawl situations, this is gonna be really smooth because the motor's always connected to the DCT. It doesn't have to engage and disengage the clutch for that. It only has to do so when it wants the engine to power the vehicle through that six-speed DCT. If you'd rather have a plug on your Nero, there are gonna be two different options for you. There's a plug-in hybrid system that's significantly more powerful than before, and a full electric option. You'll find videos on both of those on the EV Buyer's Guide channel. There's a link down there in the description. The front seat design is new, but I found comfort pretty similar to the outgoing model. The seating position is certainly more upright than we find in the EV6, a little bit closer to the Kia Sportage. 
This model has a two-way adjustable power lumbar support, and we have a two-position memory over there on the driver's door. We have a tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty decent range of motion, but again, a little bit more of an upright seating position. The front passenger seat remains a manual model in every trim. So if you want a power passenger seat, you have to work your way up the Kia ladder. But the passenger seat proved fairly comfortable, even though it's not as adjustable as the driver's seat. Jumping into the back seat, we find a ton of room, over 81 inches of combined legroom. This is one of the vehicles where you could put a six foot tall driver up front and a rear facing child seat back here if you wanted to. Although keep in mind, this is a subcompact vehicle technically in the US. So scooting here to the middle, you won't find as much width across the rear bench as you'd find in something like a RAV4. But interesting twist, we actually have more legroom here than we find in the RAV4. And if you're a taller person, you're gonna like the fact that the front seat tracks move really far rearward. So even though this looks a little tight over here, this front seat track is moved significantly further rearward than is possible in a RAV4. So lots more legroom for everybody. And even with this seat all the way back and a little bit more reclined than I would normally like, I still have about half an inch to three quarters of an inch of legroom left. So that means that taller passengers and taller drivers can still put adults in the back seat and even some of those child seats as well. Headroom is also very generous back here. I have about two and a half inches of headroom. So very similar to the average compact crossover, again, like a RAV4. In fact, versus a RAV4, the only advantage to stepping up into that larger vehicle is gonna be the extra power you find under the hood and a tiny bit of extra width across the rear, but it's not gonna be an enormous difference. These rear seats are actually really quite comfortable. We have a fold down center armrest with two cup holders there. The rear seats fold flat with the cargo area in the back, but we don't have a recline mechanism. We do, however, have a center shoulder belt that comes out of the seat itself rather than out of the ceiling. So the cargo area is nice and square and child seats are gonna fit better right here in the middle of the vehicle. Also a nice touch, all versions have air vents for the rear passengers, something that for some reason we don't find in every compact vehicle in America. Again, the category above this. A manual hatch is standard, but a power one is available. You'll find that standard in the top trim. And behind it, we have a pretty large and square cargo area for something in this category. 22.8 cubic feet of storage space back here. Now that is smaller than you'll find in a RAV4. So the trade-off here is more legroom than a RAV4, but a smaller cargo area. On the other hand, it is very square and much more practical than the cargo area that we find in the Prius. So you can definitely do things like put this 22 inch roller bag in the upright position and still close the hatch. Looking under the load floor, we have some additional storage space down here, no spare tire, but it looks like you could probably put a compact spare tire if you didn't get the optional Harman Kardon audio system. That's where the subwoofer goes right there. The load floor can be dropped in a lower height. It was in the upper height right there. If you're debating between the hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and EV, there is something you should know. The cargo area shrinks in the plug-in hybrid, but it's the same size in the hybrid and in the EV. Now, the other thing to know is that the rear seats do move around a little bit with the electric vehicle, so you actually get a little bit less legroom on the inside, but the same size cargo area. If you get the plug-in hybrid, you get the same legroom, but you get a smaller cargo area. Now, with this vehicle, if you fold the rear seats, you'll end up with 63 cubic feet of cargo capacity total, thanks to the very square profile. That's pretty close to a lot of compact crossovers, again, like RAV4 or CRV. Now let's take a look around the interior because this is where some big changes happen. We have new buttons and switches inside. Up here we have the controls for this optional moonroof. It is a standard sized moonroof though, no panorama here. That means that it ends sort of around the front passenger's laps rather than around their heads, but it does give us that excellent headroom back there in the rear. You can see how the ceiling cuts back in up top to really maximize that headroom. As with the EV6, these are four-way ratchet style headrests, and you can see this eccentric back shape. That's so that you can hang coats or jackets or shirts or things like that over there. You can even use it to hang tablet computers depending on what's going on. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger. Since this is the SX trim, we have the optional vegan leather in here. It's basically imitation leather. It's kind of a three-tone affair. So in the middle, we have this modeled texture. Then we have sort of a fabric-like texture. Then we have more of a traditional leather texture. The back of the seat back is hard plastic to help improve durability, obviously probably to lower costs as well. And then a trick we see in other Kias continues here. We have USB-C power ports for the rear passengers integrated into the front seat backs. That's a nice touch if you do wanna use that hook to suspend your tablet computers for the kiddos in the back. 
Moving up front, we have lots of soft touch materials, but obviously not as many as you'd find in a Sportage, so hard plastics down below, but the entire upper section and the armrest, those are soft touch materials. The interior design is certainly a blend of EV6 and previous generation Nero. I think it's pretty attractive, but not quite as snazzy or as futuristic as the EV6. You see we have sort of a golf ball-like texture going on in this upper soft touch section of the dashboard. A really interesting trim strip there. This whole section of the dashboard actually ducks in. You can stick your hand quite far in there. Below that, we have a big bin-style glove compartment. I was able to fit an 11-inch tablet computer inside. And then we have the two-screen layout in the dash that is optional here. Standard, you get a small LCD over there with more of a traditional display and then a smaller 8-inch screen right here. But in the upper end trims, EX and SX, you get this two-screen layout. The screens are smaller than the ones in the EV6, and the layout is slightly different, where this infotainment screen is a little bit lower on the dash. The base screen has wireless CarPlay. This larger screen continues not to offer that particular function. Large air vents there, the same sort of controls we find in the EV6. These are somewhat controversial because the same buttons and knobs are used for the climate control and the infotainment. I find that a touch annoying. Down here we have the USB input for the system, USB-C charge only port, a Qi wireless charging mat, engine start stop button, and then the shifter changes based on the model you get. All the hybrids have this T-shifter, the others have a rotary knob style shifter. We have physical buttons for the heated and ventilated front seats, heated steering wheel, the auto brake hold mode there, electric parking brake, two big cup holders down here with these little buttons that you can open and close those little dividers. So if you'd like it to be just one large storage area, you can take your drink out, close those up, or have them pop back out for your cups. There's a direct access button for the 360 degree camera system, parking sensor disable button. And then if I open this center armrest, you'll notice that this is one enormous storage area. So you can remove that divider and use that for purses or whatever large items you might want to stuff in there. Over on the driver's side, again, this one has the optional full LCD instrument cluster. The theme does not change as much as other Kias. So it's basically the same shape layout with different colors going on. You can't get round gauges or anything like that. Then we have our trip computer and other readouts right there in the middle. The two-spoke steering wheel is very similar to the one that's in the EV6. There are paddles on the back of the steering wheel, sport grips up top, and the paddles can be used either to shift the transmission or to adjust the regen braking, even in the hybrid model. Over here, we have the buttons for the adaptive cruise control system. That's optional. Buttons to control that multifunction LCD. And then over here, we have some infotainment buttons. Over on the driver's side, you can see that the window switches and controls are on this really slanted portion. We then have the buttons for the memory seats over there and some additional controls over there on that side. One nice touch is that we have this 12 volt battery reset button that will use the high voltage battery to reset the 12 volt battery portion that the vehicle uses so if you do end up in a situation where you've left your headlights or something like that on and the 12 volt battery dies if you can get in the vehicle you can press that button and then you can just start it right back up again it's now time to get the Nero Hybrid out on the road. The first thing you're gonna notice, obviously, is the six-speed dual-clutch transmission. That's gonna give this a much more traditional feel when it comes to acceleration versus a Prius or the Corolla Cross Hybrid. Whether or not that's a good or bad thing is gonna depend on your preferences. And this is where I have to say I have read some reviews on the Nero that just blow my mind because some people will complain about the feel of this system. When you push your foot on the accelerator pedal, you have to wait for the transmission to shift. And these are the same people that claim that the Prius and the Corolla Cross Hybrid, they feel too CVT-like, too EV-like. Because the Toyota Hybrid system is constructed very, very differently. And out on the road, it's gonna feel somewhere between a car with a real CVT and somewhere between an electric vehicle just due to its construction. This, on the other hand, is gonna feel very much like a underpowered vehicle with a regular automatic transmission. Zero to 60 times are gonna happen around eight and a half seconds in this model. You have to wait for the downshifts because it has a regular transmission. So it really just depends on what you're after. Do you want that feeling of an automatic? Do you want shift paddles that are actually shifting gears for you? Or do you want that more CVT-like feel that you will find in some of the competition? Now, if I put this over into the sport mode and I start using these paddles, you'll notice that the shifts are pretty quick because it's a dual clutch, not a traditional automatic transmission, but sport mode, eco mode, regular mode, it doesn't matter. This is gonna go zero to 60 in eight and a half seconds. That's not too bad. Some people might not like that. And if you're not a fan, then you want something with more power. You want a RAV4 hybrid. It's gonna go zero to 60 around seven seconds. But the acceleration times here are right in line with a number of compact crossovers. For instance, a Nissan Rogue, it's not really gonna be any swifter than this. 
As far as braking distances go, I suspect this is going to be right around 130 feet. Performance numbers are going to be pretty similar to the first generation Nero. Now, the one thing I did notice out here on these winding mountain roads is that the handling appears a little bit more sorted than the first generation Nero. The suspension is certainly a little bit firmer than that first generation model as well. That yields slightly better handling little bit more stability in the corners. The body is definitely much flatter. We get less tip and dive, less body roll. But that doesn't mean that the Nero has turned into some sort of sports hybrid hatch. This is still very focused on fuel efficiency. It's just that Kia has continually managed to push the bar with every aspect of the Nero. So they've improved the steering, they've improved the handling. The ride has gotten firmer, so I would actually say the ride quality has lowered versus the first generation Nero. And at the same time, they have managed to improve fuel economy. Let's talk about that now because clearly that is what a hybrid is all about. I'm now up at around 3,000 feet of elevation. I started at sea level and I've still been getting 42 miles per gallon over a mixed driving route where there was some highway, some city driving, some stop and go driving, I easily was able to get 49 miles per gallon in this vehicle. So I suspect that this model's EPA rating of 48 MPG is going to be really achievable in the real world, depending on how you drive the vehicle. And that's worth noting. Unlike the Prius, if you start driving the Nero harder and you're really doing a lot of mountain climbing, you'll notice that the fuel economy in here is likely going to drop a little bit further than the Toyota hybrid system. I think that simply has to do with the way this hybrid system is designed. You should also know that even though we do have pretty decent regen ability in here, it doesn't appear to be quite as aggressive as some of the Toyota hybrids. So if you live in a hilly climate and you can really take the most advantage of regen braking, you may eke out slightly better fuel economy in the Toyota system. But again, this is going to have a more traditional feel, depending on exactly what you're after. In an interesting twist, the paddle shifters on the steering wheel operate differently depending on the drive mode you're in. If I press the steering wheel drive mode button and I turn it into sport mode, these become paddle shifters and I can control the gears on the six speed dual clutch transmission. And it will stay in sixth gear if I want it to. So I can just floor it in sixth gear, just lug the engine, have that electric motor pull more power out of the battery. I can do that if I want to. If I put it in eco mode, then these become regen paddles, very much like we find on the electric version of the Nero and of course the EV6 as well. In this vehicle, that's an interesting twist because not too many hybrids allow you this kind of control over the regen braking. And I have to admit, I do like that in this vehicle. If you want to maximize your regen braking, you want to put this in level three. You can also give this basically a very low amount of regen or you can choose auto. In the auto mode, it's going to again behave very much like the EV6 and it's going to give you very little regen if nobody's in front of me. If I'm going downhill, it's going to bump up the regen a little bit. And if you're in stop and go or slow and go traffic, it's going to use the radar sensor to adjust the amount of regen based on your distance between you and the traffic in front of you. That's a really cool touch. Although I have to say, I kind of prefer it to be in the middle mode for regen. If you're a fan of one pedal driving, we sort of have that here. I can pull on the down paddle and I get max regen and it will take me to a complete stop. And if you have the auto brake hold on, it's actually going to stop you there as well. So going to come on slowly because it's not a very big electric motor, but it will actually take me to that complete stop if you're interested in that. Now keep in mind, it's not quite one pedal driving. It's sort of one paddle driving, I guess, because you do have to pull and hold the pedal to engage that mode. You don't simply take your foot off the brake pedal, although you do get again that aggressive regen in level three. At this point in time, I don't have any official cabin noise scores, but this is certainly quieter than the last generation Nero. And the biggest thing you'll notice is even if I put it in sport mode and floor it, there's a lot less engine noise coming into the cabin. And if you're not a fan of hybrids where the engine just hangs out at a particular RPM, you're going to want to take a look at this instead because the engine is going to be much more in line with what the powertrain is doing as far as the sounds coming from the engine, the RPM level, etc. That's because again, this has that traditional six speed transmission there. Until I can get this at home to run it through my usual battery of comparisons and tests, my bottom line out on the road is pretty easy. Kia has improved just about every aspect of the Nero out on the road, except for ride quality. Now, again, that depends on exactly how you look at ride quality. Keep in mind that the reason for the ride quality decrease is that handling has become a little bit sharper. So again, less tip and dive, less body roll. This is going to be more fun out on winding mountain roads like this. 
but they've simultaneously improved the fuel economy, the cabin quietness, and of course the performance just by a hair. They've also made the drivetrain a little bit smoother. Some folks have complained about the way dual clutch transmissions feel. This is still not gonna be quite as smooth as the Kia hybrids that use a regular automatic. So the Sportage hybrid, it is gonna be a bit smoother out on the road, but because this has that motor on the dual clutch transmission, it's not gonna feel like a regular car with a dual clutch. It's not gonna feel like a Volkswagen GTI or some versions of the Kia Forte with a regular DCT. In stop and go and slow and go traffic, it doesn't have to slip the clutch with the engine as much because the electric motor is there. So it's gonna use the electric motor in those low speed crawl situations. It's only gonna start the engine when it needs to. It can then feather the engine in once the vehicle is moving thanks to that electric motor. So the entire experience is much more normal, much more automatic transmission like, but still very different than we find in the Prius or the Corolla Cross Hybrid. If you're looking to get your hands on the new Nero, these should be on dealer lots right around the time that you're watching this video. And the minimum price point is gonna be $26,490. That's gonna get you the LX Hybrid trim, 16 inch wheels, cloth seats, manual seats, but you do get the two zone automatic climate control and a standard eight inch LCD infotainment system with wireless CarPlay and Android Auto. You also get blind spot monitoring and autonomous emergency braking, but no radar adaptive cruise control in that base model. The next step up from there is gonna be the EX trim for $29,090 that gets you a combination cloth and leather interior. I haven't been able to see that in person, but we do get the power seat that we have in this model, heated seats, the leather wrapped steering wheel, I should say imitation leather wrapped steering wheel, the dual screen setup on the dashboard that you saw in this one. You also get adaptive cruise control and the regen paddles and paddle shifters on the back of the steering wheel. If you'd like a few more luxury touches, you can get the top end SX trim, which is what I've been driving today. That started at 32,490 and includes things like power folding mirrors, the gloss black trim that we find on this model, the power tailgate, the power moonroof, vegan leather interior, ventilated front seats, the upgraded Harman Kardon audio system, and importantly, laminated front windows. If you recall, I said that this is really quiet out on the road. Keep in mind that the base two versions are probably not gonna be as quiet because they won't have the laminated front windows. This particular model has some of the options that are available even on the SX trim. So this is an SX Touring trim technically, and this one is 35,140, plus of course the destination charge, tax, title, license, all that other good stuff or bad stuff, depending on how you wanna look at it. Now, at the moment, we don't know pricing on the upcoming Corolla Cross Hybrid. That is logically gonna be the most direct competitor to the new Nero Hybrid. Now, there's no plug-in hybrid version and there's no EV version from Toyota, so we don't have corollaries to the entire lineup. But we do know some of the details already. We know that this has a lot more legroom than we find in the Corolla Cross. The Corolla Cross is really tight in the back seat. We also have an interior that is much more premium, especially in the upper end trims, and remember, the price tag of the Corolla Cross Hybrid is gonna be higher than a regular Corolla Cross. Most folks have put the estimated base price at around $26,000, so probably about two grand higher than this. At the time that I'm recording this video, I don't know the price tag just yet, but strangely enough, I'm probably gonna know it next week because I will be driving some of the latest hybrid Corollas very, very soon. So keep in mind that the Nero is gonna be less expensive than those, but it's gonna be less powerful and it's gonna be front wheel drive, not the E all wheel drive system that we find in the Corolla Cross. E all wheel drive in Toyota's hybrid models is not as capable as real all wheel drive in Toyota models, but it's still more capable than not having all wheel drive at all. And if there was one feature that I really wish Kia would implement on the Nero, it would be a tiny electric motor in the back, very much like we find in the all wheel drive Prius. Now the Prius obviously is also a direct competitor to the Nero, oddly enough, even though it's an entirely different kind of vehicle because both of them are focused on fuel efficiency. And if you wanna run on gasoline, this and the Prius and the Ionic Hybrid are some of the most efficient vehicles you can buy in North America today. Over 50 miles per gallon out of this. If you wanna beat this, you really do have to buy the next generation Prius. Details are still sketchy on that. I have actually seen the Prius in person, even though I haven't been able to take pictures of it or really talk about it too much publicly, but its form factor sticks really close to the current generation Prius. So it looks like a sedan. It's actually a lift back. This obviously has a hatch in the rear, so it's much more cargo practical, much more small crossover like. And I think I would be willing to give up the difference between fuel economy in this, which is gonna be around 50 miles per gallon and likely around 60 miles per gallon in that Prius to get the more practical and usable cargo area in the back.
As always, be sure and hit that subscribe button because I will have one of these at home so I can run it through my usual battery of comparisons and testing. And again, let me know if you think we should buy a Nero and do a long-term series on the Nero. And should we get the hybrid, the plug-in hybrid, or the EV version? Or should we look at something else, something like maybe a Sportage or a Tucson plug-in hybrid because those will have real all-wheel drive and a plug for decently under $40,000. In the economy currently, that is not exactly looking as robust as it was maybe a year ago. It might be time to take a look at some less expensive high efficiency models that will likely save you fuel and of course save you when it comes time to actually buying the vehicle itself. Because this is a very inexpensive vehicle that's not gonna cost a lot to run, but it is pretty roomy and I think it's actually a relatively good looking vehicle as well. Let me know what you think about all that Hit me uh, up at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of those social places. I'll see all of you next week.